I'm going to tell you a story about uh, how I found my muse. And uh, when I was young, I always knew that I wanted to be an artist. And then at some point, it just it kind of fell out of me. I don't know why. It wasn't because my parents told me that I shouldn't be an artist. Uh, it's just that I just didn't know you could just wake up and be an artist. Uh, I didn't know how I would support myself um, or what it meant. Do I go to the studio every day? Do I wake up and draw? And of course, I used to do that. I, uh, I would come home and draw. I'd come home for home lunch. I went to real baby school, and I'd walk home for home lunch, and I had enough time to go home, and I would draw, and I would draw, and I would draw, and I'd eat my SpaghettiOs, and then I'd go back to school, and that would be it. And we had all these books at home. We had Monet books. We had a book. Uh, with Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel before it was actually cleaned. And so I thought everything was kind of dark and brooding. And I always looked at the art books and any other book I could find that was visual. So years later, I went through middle school, high school, and at some point I just kind of forgot. And when I got to college, um, I was taking anthropology classes and physics classes and all this other kind of crap that was really good. And I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Kind of. And I thought I'll do anthropology because I can observe things. I like to observe things. But in the meantime, I started taking these electives, which were art electives. And I loved it. I kind of liked it. I wasn't that good at it, though. I took a printmaking class. And in the printmaking class, I felt I couldn't draw realistically. So that meant I wasn't good. But I kept on going. And I took a sculpture class. In my sculpture class, I realized that I could cut out all these different kinds of materials and just slap them together. And somehow then, my kind of inventive side woke up, my kind of gizmo side woke up, my kind of mechanical side go, uh, woke up. And that really excited me. So from that point on, I really needed to go to grad school. So we're going to kind of jump up a little bit. So a couple years later, I moved to Chicago. I finally got into grad school. And in grad school, I met all these different people, all these kids, really. And they all thought about funky shit like me. <laughs> all of them did. I mean, all the stuff that I thought was kind of ridiculous and stupid and quirky, they thought about that. They thought about the shadows in the corners and how the dust kind of settles. And they had weird ideas of what it would take if they, what if they milked a cow for 90 days and saved the milk and then made cheese and cut the cheese into a pattern and, and all took the enzymes and turned those enzymes into pills. Wouldn't that be cool? And I'd be like, that is cool, but you gotta do it. And I thought that was great. But grad school also really stifled the creativity of our me. And all of a sudden, after two years, I would have all these professors come into my studio and they'd say, Charlie, like you you have to really consider where this material comes from. You know, these t-shirts were made in the third world country and they were made by poor people and I don't see any of that in that t-shirt, in this thing you're making. And I was like, I know, but that's not what I want to make. And I don't want to make work where I have to defend before I've even made it. I don't want to make work that is like an equation. I don't want to think about this stuff. For me, art kind of happens in this way that it kind of happens, but I didn't know what that kind of happens part was. I thought, I want to make work the work that I want to make. So one week, I had two professors come in, David Davidson and Fritz Buhner. And my studio was a mess at that point. I had all these clothes, strewn all over the place, and I had piles of hair that I'd accumulated from cost cutters. And it was very messy and very dirty. And my, I have to wear a mask because uh, I didn't want to catch any kind of a virus or anything like that. And uh, my professors came in and they lambasted me. And when they left, I kind of cried. I think I kind of cried. But there was also this part of me that was like, Because you think that this is trash, but lo and behold, I found a piece of trash in J.P. Park last week, and I'm going to make a piece.
Saturdays. And for the first time in two years, I'm actually excited. I actually want to make something. And I didn't know what the hell this piece was. I knew what it was. I didn't know what it meant, though. I just knew what it was. I had a picture of this thing in my mind, and I wanted to make it. And so I made it. And my professors were like, okay, like, this is kind of crazy. This is, they didn't know what to make of it. They're like, well, what does it mean? And I had to find speech to kind of figure out what it meant. But I really didn't know what it meant. But I didn't really give a shit because I had made something that I really, that I kind of loved. Um, but this story really is about this piece. The piece that I made now got me into something else. I made this piece when I applied for this residency where all these grad students from around the country apply to, and it's in Maine. And I applied for this, and all my other friends and my potential friends and all my enemies, my friends and my enemies, applied for this thing. And I applied, and lo and behold, I got in. And I knew this work got me in. So I also knew that this work validated me something on a very guttural level. And I decided that actually the work that I wanted to make had really nothing to do with politics, had nothing to do with third world endeavors. Uh, and I didn't want to make something that was an equation. I actually wanted to make, some, to make something that was more kind of from here, more from the gut, more private, um, less specific, nameless, but very, very, uh, with pinpoint, kind of an emotional attitude. And even more so than that, I realized that what I was truly interested in was not um, any specific theme in particular. What I was interested in is um, basically systems of delivery. That's what I like. I'm interested in making and communicating something from here and having you, the audience, be a participant. So when I got to the Skowhegan School, I screwed around and I made a couple pieces that had to do with this other piece made out of hair. But I realized that that piece was kind of too, uh, kind of illustrative, and it kind of bored me. And so I kind of moved on. And I decided I wanted to make something that didn't really behave as a piece of art, that wasn't actually art. And I was hoping that people wouldn't even think it was art. Um, so this is the piece. So um, the piece that I made uh, was a response to the school. And the school, of course, you have all these 27-year-olds were fueled with, with ego, and, and not and a very fragile ego at that, and they're all there to make their stuff. So this piece I wanted to make uh, was based on the emotions that I was feeling. And of course I was feeling kind of insecure, but at the same time I was feeling kind of empowered. And I wanted to deal with, I wanted to make something that dealt with this power distinction, with this power dynamic. I wanted to deal some, make something that was had a kind of a privacy, but also acts like a theater. So I decided to make, to take, um, to buy some wood. Um, this stuff called wafer wood, which is a very cheap building material. It's even cheaper than plywood. And I decided that I would uh, make a box out of it. But not just any box. It'd be a box that was three and a half feet by three and a half feet by five and a half feet. And of course, that is a perfect size for me to get into. <laughs> And uh, the box reminded me, of course, of a coffin. So it was kind of coffin-esque. Um, it was also um, behaved like an art crate, a common art crate. So you could actually pack art inside of it. And I thought, that's great, because I could pack art inside of it. So it, it crossed these two worlds. Then also went into the great pretentious world of art. And it behaved a little bit like a piece of minimalist sculpture except this piece was just kind of slapped together and glued. I took four pieces of rope, and I hung it from the ceiling. I put a trap door in the top so no one could see it. Um, and then I took a 30-watt yellow bug light, and I stuck it in one end of it. If you're looking up, and the box is up here, you would see a hole cut out of one end. And what I did is I, um, I, put, I took an old t-shirt and I took the t-shirt and I cut the pop top off, the crew part, and I cut the top off 
And on one side, I sewed yellow to it. On the other side, I sewed black to it. But I only had this white t-shirt, so that's what I'm showing you. So I cut a piece out like this, and I, I made sure I wanted it to be kind of used and gross. And I took it out, and I stapled it to this bottom. So it would be this kind of hole that you kind of see, this kind of orifice. You have to kind of stick your head up into it, or not stick your head up into it. So I stapled into it, and I sewed around here to show my level of craft, my intention, as all my professors would love to hear me say. And then I made a little stool on the bottom of the wafer board, and I hung it from the ceiling. So there was one night where a lot of us uh, sculptors could put our work in this big hall. So I decided to put my sculpture up there. And about a half an hour before uh, people started showing up, I, um, I got in there. I got a ladder up there. I hopped in the front. And then I pushed the ladder off and made it, and made it fall. So um, uh, no one would know that I was actually in there. And um, the last thing I did is I got a big black forest and I put it in there next to the light bulb. And I got in there. And I wasn't naked, OK? I didn't do that kind of stuff. You know? I was in like a, you know, a t-shirt and my boxers. And, uh, and I just sat there. And I didn't really quite know. I kind of figured it out up until then. But I put a lot of risk out to now. And I was like, you're just going to do it, and you'll figure it out. And I was like, this is not, you don't try this stuff at home. You know, yeah. you, don't, you don't do this stuff. Uh, but I did it. I'm like, if I don't do this, I'm just not going to do it. So I'm like, I'll figure it, I'll figure it out. But I have to do it in order to resolve the piece. And if I don't test it, I'll never resolve it. So I have to fall on my face. So people started coming in, people started coming in. And I could see people going down. I could see people kind of going underneath. And they see the step stool. And of course, the step stool means step. And that's why I put it there. And once you get on the step stool, it also makes you a bit, uh, kind of a part of something, like you're on a soapbox. So I would look down, and I'd see people going by. And it was dark up here, so they couldn't see me. But of course, at some point, somebody got on this stool. And then they kind of put their hand up there. <laughs> I saw Tamara, and she kind of went up there, and she kind of stuck her head a little bit, and she kind of, she just left. She wasn't going to do it. You don't stick your head or anything else into a box in the case. So finally, somebody, I don't remember who it was, but they went up there, they got on the stool, and they just kind of put their head through. And it was about 15 degrees warmer than the outside environment. And it was kind of sweaty and musty. And it smelled kind of sweet. <laughs> and then I turned on the light. And I was about this <laughs> And they were shocked. They said, Charlie. <laughs> and I just kind of smiled. And I was like, hi. <laughs> and they're like, oh, great. And they kind of left. And I was like, shit, this is not what I wanted. This is not what I wanted at all. And all of a sudden, I realized what I had to do. I had, I had to up the ante of walking along this sword, this double-edged sword, you know, where it could fall any way. I wanted to make something that was funny, that was kind of a joke, that used the rhythm of a joke. But a joke works because there's a schism between what you know and what you feel. And it was like, that's what I want. That's what I want out of my art. So I realized, how can I do this? How can I do this? Because I can't talk and I can't smile. Because if I do that, I'll let you kind of get away with it. And say, OK, I get it. Bye. See you later. So what I did is I made a rule that I would never talk and I would never, ever smile. And I wasn't sure if I could do this. But I am proud. And so I didn't want to fail. And so I said, I have to be a material in my own piece. And I will never smile. And I will never talk. The next person who came up there did the same thing. They stuck their head up. I waited. I waited. And I thought, hmm, this is a variable. 
I can actually for as long as I want to. I can decide when this person is ready, when they are cooked. <laughs> I turned on the light and they were shocked. And I just sat there, looking right at them. And they laughed. And then they turned on the <laughs> And then they cried. <laughs> And then Mel came in. Mel, Mel, the resident guru. And Mel came in. And he was kind of, he just went. And I fed him cake too. <laughs> and I fed Tamara cake. I fed everybody cake. Not everybody, but a ton of people. And in that box, Everybody had the right to take their head out anytime they wanted. And the people from the outside got a completely different experience. From the outside, they just saw somebody sticking their head into the box. And they kind of sit there, kind of moving their body or twitching. Kind of stay, going like this, or going back in. But the other thing that happened is that everybody who stuck their head into the box would do the same thing. They'd take their head out, and someone would say, well, what happened, what happened? They're like, <laughs> what happens in this box stays in this box. And I'm not gonna give up my experience because I wanna see you stick your head into this box because you will have something else. You will have a completely different experience than I have. So this piece, I, I never quite named, I just call it a title. But it's a Rosetta Stone that guides me to this day in every piece that I make. And it guides me in terms of thinking about what is the best way to commit the crime? What is the best way to, co to come up with the lowest the common denominator? I don't want to be an artist who relies on a certain material. I want to be an artist who relies on a certain attitude, on a certain kind of relationship that I have with my audience, the participant, uh, which is you. So that's it. Thank you very much.